Uh, one of the reasons that I wondered, I wanted to write it with Marie was because this is a, this is a real Canadian story for sure. So I'll just plunge right in. Does that work? Yes, it does. Okay, so we called it Pierre's Song because back in 1815, the uh, sort of patriarch uh, in the middle of the story, Pierre Beaupre, who was living down the river in Sorel, Quebec, uh, wrote a poem, a song, because he had 12 sons, 12, 11 sons, 11 sons, I guess, and 10 of them had enlisted in the British Armed Forces in Upper Canada and Lower Canada to fight against the United States in the War of 1812. And uh, he was missing them. So he wrote a charming song uh, that's in the book. I just have a fragment of it there that somehow got preserved in Kingston by some member of the family we haven't been able to track down. And it was actually published around 1870 by a Quebec historian of the militia. And um, so he's uh, lamenting uh, his missing sons who all went away to war uh, in, sorry? And they all came back. And they all came back, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so that's in the, that's at the center of the book, really. So the Beaupre's um, arrived in New France very early on. Uh, or at least their oldest descendant did, that's name of Hélène de Porte, who was the first woman born in New France in 1620. And uh, they're all descended from her. And uh, I, uh, this is, I think, important Canadian story because in Kingston particularly, we sort of, we almost ignore uh, French-Canadian heritage. It's, uh, you know, the limestone city and it's a loyalist city. And, and yet, people like this, were, were quite, there were quite a number of them in Kingston during the 1800s and early 1900s, and they really helped to build, helped to build the town. So this is kind of their story in many ways. So there's quite a few Beaupre's, uh, more than 3,000 in North America today. And it was a bit of a job pulling that thread out to see which ones were involved with our family. Marie's a descendant of uh, Pierre that's in the book. So she did the 25 years or so of family research that made this book possible. Um, there is a Cote Beaupre, the Beaupre Shore, just east of Quebec City on the north shore of the St. Lawrence, but it's not connected to the family. And uh, there's a shrine, a Catholic shrine, along the north shore called St. Anne de Beaupre. It's not connected to the family either. Um, Apparently that Beaupre uh, is said to have originated because the first French sailors, mariners coming up the river remarked on these beautiful meadows along the north shore of the St. Lawrence just below Quebec City and that's Beaupre in French. So it wasn't connected to the family. The Beaupre's we're talking about were originally farmers uh, from Normandy and um, like a lot of the colonists in New France, Normandy and Brittany. And um, the ones we're talking about arrived very, very early. As I mentioned, Hélène de Porte uh, arrived uh, in her mother's womb uh, in 1620. And uh, Marie and I still have a little dispute from time to time because there's uh, a little gap in the written history that uh, there's, they, they claim that she was the first woman born in New France, but I think the evidence suggests to me as a historian that she was born about two days before they landed aboard the ship that landed in New France. So people split hairs, but I'm willing to call her the first woman born in New France myself. Um, so they, they arrived in Kingston in uh, 18... Well, Beaupre's were here before 1814, but the family that we're going to talk about arrived here in 1814 to work in the Royal Dockyard for the British Navy. So, beginning at the beginning, as historians like to do, lovely painting of Champlain, uh, romantic envisioning of Champlain building the first 
first housing, the Habitant, Habitation at Quebec City in 1608. And that on the portrait on the right is his wife, Hélène de Champlain. And Hélène de Port was her namesake and Hélène de Champlain was her godmother. Um, so connections to the very, very earliest days uh, on the continent of any Europeans to speak of. And that's the only image we know of that uh, seems to be Hélène de Port. She became quite an important personage in the early colony because, well, she was celebrated as the first infant born in New France, not just the first woman, first girl. Um, and it was, a, it was a sign to all the colonists that, oh my God, the colony is actually going to survive. Because there were only about a hundred of them. Uh, and they were under constant attack by the Iroquois because Champlain had provoked a 100 years war with the Iroquois nation. And uh, I think he'd been misled into it by his Huron Wendat allies, who were always at war with the Iroquois. Uh, anyway, uh, so she was uh, related to, uh, by baptism to Champlain's wife. And Champlain actually left her money in his will, 300 livres, which was quite a lot of money back in uh, 1640 or so. And uh, she became a sage femme, which is a midwife, uh, and taught her daughters the trade as well, profession. Um, interesting portrait. Um, you know, it's a, if that's her, we think it is, very stylish clothing for French colonists in the frontier when they didn't even have the wherewithal to build barns in a lot of cases. So, um, very interesting that she became quite an important person. Um, and he married, she married the only son of Louis Hebert. And Louis Hebert is a famous guy. He was the first farmer in New France uh, and became their first apothecary as well, which probably meant that he learned a lot of herbal medicine from the indigenous folks. Um, only son of Louis Hebert, and he died a few years later, five years later. Um, and then she remarried a guy named Noel Morin, uh, who was who had an important trade in the colony at that time. He was a wheelwright and a cartwright, so uh, they made quite a bit of money. And their daughter, Agnes, one of many, married a fellow named Beaupre. And uh, 1671, Ignace Bonhomme Diet Beaupre. And Diet means called Beaupre. And uh, his sort of baptismal name was Bonhomme. And uh, so for a long time in the colonies and in Europe at the time, nobody had a last name. You know, there was always uh, Henri, and if he was a strawberry picker, he was a Frasier. And uh, that became Fraser. And uh, so the names evolved and the family of Ignace split. And then one of them kept the Beaupre name, which we follow. And the other ones continued on as the Bonhams. Eighteen children. Uh, she had eight, eight from her first marriage and ten, ten, three from her. Oh, is that? Did I get that wrong in here? Oh, it's correct in the book, though, right? It's correct. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, three from her first marriage and fifteen from her second marriage, and. Uh, the, uh, she lived at the time when they got a brand new colonial governor named the Count of Frontenac, Comte de Frontenac. And uh, he was the guy who brought an expedition here in 1673 and built a fort and named it after himself in Kingston, of course, Fort Frontenac. And uh, he was not a popular guy among any of the settlers because he was very arrogant. And when he came to build Fort Frontenac, he had basically conscripted all the farm workers in the colony to help him build it. So they were taken away during the summer during um, planting and harvest time and um, that made him even less popular. And that was also he could enrich himself in the fur trade. So there's a romantic 
portrait of Frontenac coming in all his pomp and splendor up the St. Lawrence to meet. And he met there the uh, Mohawks and the Iroquois who were in charge of this part of the world at the time. Um, and Agnes, I guess at the time, was nursing probably her 10th child. Uh, and her husband had been taken away probably by Frontenac, so she was a little pissed with Frontenac. And uh, she apparently was overheard uttering insulting words against the governor. And that was not a legal thing to do in the colony. And apparently the governor himself laid charges to be brought up against the high court in New France. And, uh, and when he was brought up to the high court, uh, it made the governor even more angry because the, gov the, the new governor tried to get on the jury in the high court and they refused. It was closed session. Governor could not be allowed in and they acquitted her of uh, insulting the governor and probably one of the reasons was her brother was on the superior court as well. So I can imagine all the colonists having a quiet laugh at the governor's expense at that time and she went back to the farm and, and lived on for another number of years. Um, and they had a son named Noel Bonham, and he became a surveyor, which was a recognized profession at the time, involved going to school and, you know, learning mathematics, upper, higher mathematics, and that sort of thing. So an intelligent guy. And they obviously had some money, because that was only done through the Jesuit schools and had to be paid for somehow. Um, and the grandson of her son, Noel, wrote the title song. That was Pierre. So we skip ahead to Pierre because there's two generations or a generation in between that lived a quiet life. It was a time of peace in North America from 1701 to 1740 or so. And uh, so they just farmed and there's very little about them in the records except that uh, I think it was Noel or Noel's son uh, was the cantor of a church in uh, near Quebec City. And that's about all we know of them, except they died, birthed and died, and they had some kids. <clears throat> but Pierre, who wrote the song, was 10 years old when uh, Wolfe and Montcalm fought on the Battle of Plains of Abraham, and um, New France became the British colony of Quebec. And uh, he was 22, just 12 years later, the United States invaded at the beginning of the American Revolution uh, to try and capture Quebec and drive the British out of North America. And uh, he was 22, and he enlisted in the militia in Quebec City, which was under siege for the whole winter of 1775 to 76. And uh, there's a list of the 400 heroes who were trapped in the Quebec City, who stayed to support uh, the British, and then 10,000 reinforcements arrived in the spring and drove out Benedict Arnold and the American troops. He was on their side then. Uh, switched sides later, of course. Um, so uh, he got married just before that invasion began in, in uh, late August. In May he got married to Anne Angelique Martin, and uh, he was married in the Church of Notre Dame de Quebec, which is still there. It's now the um, cathedral, and uh, if you ever get a chance to visit it in Quebec City, there's a brass or gold, I guess a gold lamp in the chancel that was donated by Louis XIV at this time. And it's still hanging in this beautiful basilica, uh, which burned more or less to the ground during Wolf's siege and then was rebuilt and then burned again and has been rebuilt. But this chancel lamp donated by the king of the Sun King uh, still remains there and you could see it. Um, so he's just one of the 710 militiamen on the honor roll during the siege. And it was interesting because he recorded his occupation to the British clerk as a merchant of Marchand. And that, in that time, you know, that implied fur trade.
basically. Um, and, and trading, and I'll get back to that a little later. Um, he was in, under siege in Quebec until the um, reinforcements arrived in the spring of 76, and he was not allowed leave, so he didn't even see his son um, af for after he was born for several months. Um, but then the, the, the invading American force was defeated, thrown back into the United States, um, and uh, he continued on apparently as what we figured is an itinerant merchant. He was traveling salesman of some kind. Um, for, for until 1791, uh, long after the revolution ended. And uh, we know this because we have a record of where his children were born. And some of them were born in Ancien and Lorette, which is Quebec City. Some of them were born 150 miles upriver in Berthierville. And some of them in Sorel across the river from Berthierville. And some in Montmagny downriver from Quebec City. So. That, to me, having studied this sort of era, meant that he probably owned a schooner. And uh, because, I can, you know, they had a large family. And I can't imagine them, there were no roads at the time. So he had to be traveling up and down the river in a schooner. And I doubt his wife would have let him put them in an open boat to row up and down the river. So they probably lived on the schooner. And that's why their kids were born in several places, but we haven't found any proof of that yet. Anyway, his wife probably got mad at him for this nomadic existence because in 1791 he decided he would become a surveyor and he received a surveyor's license and uh, he settled down in Birchayville where her family was from and St. Ours, which is just across the river. And uh, he stayed loyal to the British. He became a militia officer during this period. Uh, I think he was a lieutenant, I think, as I recall. I don't think he was a captain, but lieutenant. And he was, uh, he stood out, Pierre did, earlier than when he wrote this letter because he was one of 11 French-Canadian militia officers who wrote a public letter uh, supporting the governor at a time when that was not a popular thing to do in Quebec because 1794 they had passed a new militia law that um, a diddled number of things that were very unpopular and there was a lot of this was after the French Revolution began as well so there were a lot of um, seditionists sent over by France to try and raise trouble in the colony and some from the United States at the time as well. And uh, so they were saying, oh, if you join the militia, you're going to be sent to the West Indies for life and you'll never get out again. And so the commander of Pierre Bonhomme's militia company uh, made a speech to say, it's all BS. Don't worry. It's not changing that radically. Don't, don't worry. And so these 11 officers in his battalion wrote a letter that was publicized in the Quebec Gazette, which was the only newspaper at the time, and was typically just a government newspaper where they announced, you know, government news. So he made the papers publicly supporting the British when it was not very popular. Uh, and that's just a graphic showing here at the left-hand corner. Do I have a... Or probably not. Okay, so left hand bottom corner is Montreal. And then Sorel and Berthierville going moving down the river. Um, and then Trois Rivières, which is halfway roughly between Montreal and Quebec City. Then Quebec itself, which is where Anskin Lorette was. And then Montmagny down river from Quebec. So he was trading in uh, those places and couldn't have done that in a wagon. And uh, his wife was along with them with their family. Um, they couldn't have done that anyway except being in a river schooner. So Sorel, across the river, from downriver from Montreal and on the south side, uh, was already a major shipbuilding center uh, under the French regime and uh, remains a shipbuilding center in Quebec to the present day. They've built 
all sorts of steel warships and continue to be one of the contractors for the new Canadian frigate program. Uh, and Pierre and his and one son uh, bought property and they all seem to have settled in Sorel um, uh, after 1807. And he was a surveyor, of course, so he could settle down in one place. And uh, his, two of his sons, one of them named Amable, and the other one in Maine, Prisca Jean Dudon, uh, went to shipwright school, apprenticed to shipwrights in Sorel, and uh, became apparently quite skilled. And so the War of 1812 began. This family's living in Sorel. Two of the sons are building wooden ships. And the War of 1812 begins, and uh, Amabla, that we'll talk about now, eventually comes in 1814, comes to Kingston and is hired by the British to be a shipwright in the Royal Dockyard in Kingston and begins to work on the warships there. Along with his brother, Priest Jean Dieudon, and, and half of the workforce in the Royal Dockyard were French Canadian. Out of 500, there were at least 250 of them. Um, and it was probably proportionately larger even than that because the last year of the war, they allowed them to bring their families. And they all lived on where RMC is today, in barracks and shanties, and uh, lived and worked there um, right through the war. And uh, I'm sure the, the shipwrights, of course, got all got to know each other. They were compatriots speaking French in a Kingston. And um, so he met another shipwright named Kess, and he married their, his daughter. Uh, three years after the war ended in Kingston. And there's a, there's a log book, and you can't see it, but down these two highlighted lines, one of them is for Amable, and one of them is for Jean, John uh, Beaupre. And uh, they were paid, I can hardly read it myself, but they were paid about 10 shillings a day to be shipwrights working for the British Navy. Um, and, of course, one of the problems for searching boat prey is because there's hundreds of ways to spell it. We list a number of them in the book. 19. 19 in the book that we found. So that made it a little more tricky to pull these threads. Uh, that's a logbook from the British Royal Dockyard. And that's the ship they were working on, HMS St. Lawrence. And St. Lawrence, when it was launched in September of 1814, was the largest warship ever launched on the Great Lakes. Uh, 112 guns, uh, eight or 900 men to fight it and sail it at the same time. And uh, same size as Admiral Nelson's flagship, the Victory, uh, at the Battle of Trafalgar. So, when it was launched, in September of 1814, the American Navy on the lake retired to its home port in Sackett's Harbor and never came out again during the war. It outclassed the other vessels by that much. Um, and they had two of them building in Sackett's Harbor. So if the war went on, there would have been a big ship fleet on the Lake Ontario, but it ended uh, at the end of 1814. Um, and it's comparable to the last big ship built in Kingston shipyards, uh, last steel ship built in Kingston shipyards in 1953, which was almost the same length, 259 feet, almost exactly the same tonnage, 2,200 tons. And uh, do I have that? Oh, I, I was trying to save time, so I didn't put in the drawing that measured HMS St. Lawrence from the tip of her bowsprit to the end of her jib boom, the end of her banker boom, but almost the same, same size as this freighter, a big ship. So, Pierre's song wrote it in 1815, and this was remarkable in itself because hey, by 1815 there were not that many uh, French Canadians who were uh, really literate. Um, it cost money and they had to go to Jesuit school, and uh, you didn't need 
reading and writing to work on the farms, which is what they were. They were all farmers. And so Pierre, who became a surveyor, obviously took advantage of his education. And that's, that stood out um, because there are very few written, self-written documents from that period to study at all by, for historians. So this is the story of Pierre's sons. Uh, Amable had a younger brother, Louis, and he volunteered as well into the British Provincial Marine at the age of 14, became a midshipman. And uh, when the Americans burned the town of York in the spring of 1813, he was captured with a number of others uh, and then exchanged a little later. And his older brother, Charles, was on Lake Erie for sailing in what they called then before the Navy took over, it was called the Provincial Marine, and it was operated as a department of the Army inland, um, but it was essentially the Navy. And he served at Amherstburg, which is just across the river from Detroit, and was wounded in 1813, and he was one of the few soldiers of any kind on the British side who got a pension. And he got a disability pension for a saber slash to his leg that I think later killed him. Um, after the war. My other six sons served in the British Army and they all survived the war. Uh, Charles died only a couple of years afterwards. Um, so this is after the war. The British had, the British during the war had moved their dockyard on Lake Erie. They lost the Battle of what's called, one of the names for it is the Battle of Lake Erie. The other one is Battle of Put-in Bay. Um, to the Americans in the summer of 1813. And there's a famous quote um, from the American Admiral uh, Commodore at the time that says, uh, uh, was something like, I think, don't give up the ship because his flagship was so smashed up during the battle that he transferred his flag to another vessel and then they won the battle. So that was a famous quote that rings down through history to this day from that battle, but the British lost that battle. And then they moved their, their uh, um, home port on Lake Erie from Amherstburg up around into Georgian Bay. Uh, and uh, there they built, at the end of the war, uh, just after the war, a couple more little warships to come see as one. We were very lucky to get Peter Rindlisbacher to uh, help us. He donated his copy, an image of his painting for the front cover. And he's a very famous Canadian marine artist who went to Queens. And uh, uh, he gave one of his paintings, it's in the White House uh, to this day, uh, apparently. Um, and a very evocative painter as well. So, Amable, after the war, was up at um, uh, their, their dockyard on Georgian Bay, and they closed everything down in 1819. But instead of going back to C Quebec, uh, Lower Canada, he settled in Prescott, down the river. Um, and Prescott seemed to be a good place, I think, because Prescott's the foot of the passage from Lake Ontario. That's as far down as sailing ships could go in the river. And after that, they had to be bateaus, um, wooden, small wooden boats all the way to Montreal. So there was a lot of repair work and transshipping and that sort of thing. And he settled in Prescott in 1820. And his son, Edward, was born there that year. And eight years later, he had started his own shipbuilding business and uh, completed his first commercial ship, a schooner called Prescott. Uh, the newspapers reported it as the largest on Lake Ontario at the time, 4,500 bushels, which meant it was probably about 80 feet or so, something like that. Uh, but in 1835, the Rideau Canal opened. And that was, of course, a military canal that meant they bypassed Prescott. Uh, the ships all went up to Ottawa, 
then down the Rideau Canal to Kingston. So they didn't have to go through Prescott where the river is only a mile wide and uh, they were afraid of being shot at uh, if war broke out again. So Prescott became um, much less important as a shipbuilding place. Um, but his son apprenticed to him and he worked across the border in New York and he built a 68 foot steamboat, wooden steamboat in New York State in 37. But 37 and 38 were turbulent years in Canada. Um, Mackenzie's rebellion in Upper Canada in 37 was matched by one in Lower Canada and there was a battle practically on Amabla's front doorstep in Prescott um, called the Battle of the Windmill um, where uh, a group of militiamen on their own hook uh, called themselves hunters crossed the river from the states and attacked expecting Upper Canada to rise and free themselves from the tyrant King George, uh, which didn't happen. They were all defeated. Johnny MacDonald was the defense lawyer for their leader who was captured, uh, but he failed. The guy was hung. <laughs> and many of the others were transported to Australia. Um, but Amabla, I think, decided at that time that Prescott might be, not be the best place to raise his family. So he moved to Kingston. Um, and uh, he moved to the foot of West Street where there's a boat ramp now um, right on the corner where there's a Celtic cross for all those Irish poor Irish famine uh, refugees and it was right on that corner where they had their they established their shipyard uh, not, I, it doesn't seem like they owned it I think they leased it uh, for a number of years uh, but they all went into partnership, the whole Beaupre family there, Amabla, his sons, John, Isaiah, Edouard, and Pierre, and his nephew, nephew Bruno, John's, John Dieudonne Priska's son. Um, so they began to build there, uh, but around the same time as the Rideau Canal was finished, KP opened in Portsmouth Village, and Portsmouth Village began to expand because there was literally nothing there except a farm or two. So they began to, the, the, the fort, or the fort, the prison needed all sorts of supplies. So a village began to spring up to sell stuff to the penitentiary. And uh, it also was a, a nice harbor. So a fellow named Dickinson in 1840 built what's called to this day the Long Pier. And that basically was on the footprint of the breakwater that's still there in ports of Olympic Harbor. And that made it a viable port for ships to, um, ships to use. And uh, so around that time, Pierre, um, Pierre built a floating dry dock at his yard downtown, uh, which was the first one in Kingston. And basically it was built of three hulls, caissons they called them, that. Um, when a boat, when the marine rail, railways are too busy for the haul of boats out and work on them for repairs, this marine floating dry dock could be sunk and then the ship floated in between the caissons and then they'd pump the caissons out and it would lift the boat out of the water so it could be worked on. It wasn't the first in the world but it was the first one in Kingston and it made the newspaper. A lot of this we we've discovered in the old newspapers, which is real history. Um, yeah, I wouldn't uh, ever discount what's there. You have to take it all with a grain of salt, uh, for sure. Um, but in 1846, they're still downtown, and he built a steam barge, 100-ton steam barge called the Bristol. Um, but a year or two later, uh, I think they decided to move to Portsmouth and um, they rented a marine railway there right at the head of the harbor behind where Peter's drugstore is now. Um, number one, lot number one in Portsmouth Village and uh, they got reported that year in, um, in the WIG 
about a beautiful little boat they'd launched called the Prince of Wales. Glided into the water like a duck. This is why you have to take some things, you know, with a grain of salt. And uh, they lengthened her about 25 feet, which it turned out was about a quarter. She was about 100 feet and became a 125 footer. The workmanship of the builders is said to be of the first order. So that was the Beaupre's reputation building. And there's where they lived. This is on the right, sorry. That's Kingston Penitentiary. This is what used to be called Hatter's Bay, now Ports of Olympic Harbor. The shipyard was there. Peter's Drugs is right there now. Uh, right here is the Portsmouth Tavern, uh, which was built by one of Pierre's sons. And uh, this is, the family lived up here on the hill um, uh, for quite a while. So this is uh, what the Marine Railway, it's hard to see, but this is a cross section, horizontal cross section. So you see horse drawn, this is on a big windlass that cranks a chain that pulls the boats out of the water, right? And I always thought that this must have been a steam um, windlass, but no. At uh, the turn of the century, 1900, they still had horses pulling these ships out of the water. Uh, 1846, they built a 91-foot steamer called the Cataraqui in Portsmouth Harbor. And 1848, they were still working downtown as well, two places at once, getting to be a fairly substantial firm. Um, they added a fourth case onto their floating dry dock, but it seems 1848, something happened. They made a decision. Uh, for some reason, we don't know. But um, some of them uh, that we're talking about, Pierre's family moved to, Ports to Portsmouth Village, but one of his sons, John Priska, moved to the States along with his son, Pierre's nephew. So, you know, what was that decision about? Did they just finally decide that operating two were, you know, was too difficult? Or did they have a family quarrel? Or did they decide to expand their empire across the border? Who knows, uh, family dynasties were built like that. Uh, we don't know, but uh, his son and his nephew left that year to go uh, across the border. So here uh, we begin to talk mostly about Amabla's eldest son, Edouard, and um, Edward was largely responsible for building a famous steam, wooden steam uh, side wheeler called the Comet. And the Comet was the first ship built in Kingston to go down a set of new canals to Montreal from here. And uh, he purchased that lot up on the hill in, Port in Portsmouth Village. There's the Comet. It's actually quite a nice drawing of her. She's not that pretty from some views, but that was the first steamer to go from Kingston down to Montreal in the new canals to Montreal. Uh, this is an interesting story, entertaining story that you stumble across from time to time. 1851, Edouard met and eloped with a Protestant girl, Anne Esther Moffat, whom he met and lived in Niagara-on-the-Lake. We don't know exactly what he was doing there or how they met. I think because of the culture of the time, apparently he was crewing. Uh, a lot of the shipbuilders had to, of course, be able to sail their ships to demonstrate how they worked to the buyers. So he was also a shipmaster. But as an itinerant shipmaster, I doubt he would have had time to meet and court a young Protestant woman. So we don't know. He was probably working in the shipyard. Uh, they all knew each other, and there was a famous shipyard in Niagara-on-the-Lake called under William Shikluna. Anyway, somehow they met, and uh, they eloped one weekend, and they got married across the river in the United States. And that may have been because nobody in Niagara-on-the-Lake would marry a Catholic and a Protestant. 
That's entirely possible. Anyway, they found a pastor across the lake, across the river, and uh, <laughs> then he said, okay, hun, you're going to have to go and meet my mother now and my father, and he put her on a boat alone because he was going somewhere or couldn't go with her. So she turned up in Portsmouth Harbor all alone to meet her Catholic, new Catholic mother-in-law. And uh, you, one can only imagine that meeting. Uh, it's kind of fun to imagine it sometimes. Uh, but they apparently ended up getting along fine. Um, David? Yeah. He hadn't told his parents that he was getting married. No. So this poor girl arrives, knock, knock. Hi, I'm home. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. It, yeah. it, out. it would have been quite a dramatic scene, I'm sure. But they took her in yep. and uh, carried on. And uh, Amabla died in 1863. And his son, Edward, that year began to build what is now the Portsmouth Tavern uh, as a house, a uh, residence for his family. And the uh, Portsmouth Tavern uh, remained in the Beaupre family for 100 years. And you still hear people around Kingston calling it Bopes because it was uh, owned by the Beaupres. And this is uh, probably his greatest shipbuilding achievement, the Oliver Mowat, three-masted schooner, uh, famous ship on the Great Lakes. And when she was launched, the uh, Premier of Ontario, Oliver Mowat himself, attended with his daughter, and his daughter christened the boat. 3,000 people watched her launch out at Mill Haven. And uh, she lasted for 50 years. And we often think of, you know, the warships built in the War of 1812 that within about five years after they were built, they were rotting and uh, said to be because they, they used green wood during the war, they didn't have time to season the wood. But these ships, these schooners on the Great Lakes, and there were literally uh, more than a thousand of them built, roughly the same size as the Blue Nose or bigger. And they lasted a very long time as wooden ships in fresh water. Um, this was kind of a treasure we discovered. Um, this marine painting is by a guy named Nicholas Henderson, who's another well-known to maritime painters, a Kingston painter. Um, well, a couple of his paintings hang in the Yacht Club. Uh, and he painted this picture of Oliver Mowat in a storm, losing sails. And he painted it from personal experience because apparently he'd been aboard during that particular voyage. So, but the painting is lost. Nobody knows where it is. All we have now is an image taken from a glass plate and nobody knows where that is anymore either. So, unfortunately, if, if anybody could find, if anybody could find that, it would be wonderful. Um, but she was a very long-lived ship. This is 1920. She was launched in 1873. And this is Kingston in 1920. I'm, I'm pretty sure this is the moat. There were not that many schooners still working in 1920. Uh, and she's coming in with a load of coal. You can see this is uh, now the Marine Museum, Kingston Shipyards, with the big stack. There was a big grain elevator uh, downtown, and I think, I think that may be the Shoal, Marine, uh, Shoal Tower. And I think Caiz, the, 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 they're bringing the, this is a yacht club boat right here anchored off. So I think they're bringing the Moat in beside Kingston Yacht Club, where the Elgin apartments are these days. But until about 1960, there was nothing there but a great coal heap 30 feet high. And so they're probably bringing coal to add to the stack that was used to heat all the houses and the factories. In any case, she was rammed and sunk that year by a steamer on Lake Ontario. And uh, the, they've, they've found her wreck and they've put divers down. And this is a sketch of what she looks like on the bottom off Prince Edward County to this day. Another one he, he built and designed with Queen of the Lakes. These are pretty well known at the time, Nellie Hunter, Annie Falconer. That's a famous one that divers go to all the time now. <clears throat> 
This is Annie Minnis in uh, uh, Port, Port Hope, I think, loading grain. These are all bulk shipping boats using carrying anything from stone to wheat to coal. Um, barley was one important product. Um, and Edward, who uh, built the Portsmouth Tavern, became an important guy in founding Portsmouth Village. He was on their first town council, and uh, he became a tax assessor and tax collector, a very difficult job, I'm sure. Um, so he was probably a pretty good diplomat as well. And he kept that job until he retired in 1903. Um, and the Whig, in his obit, said he was, you know, faultlessly uh, incorruptible and very fair in collecting taxes and gave widows a break. And, uh, it was, you know, he was quite a guy, uh, apparently. So there's the Portsmouth Hotel in 1880, 20 years, 15 years after he built it. You can see the sign off to the, barely see it, on the screen, it says Portsmouth Hotel. And then you notice it has a door right in the corner of the building that's not there anymore, but um, that was, was not uncommon design feature in those days. And there it is again, 1934. And there is uh, grandfather of Marie's, Peter Moffat Beaupre, who, uh, moved in and then uh, transformed it into a, a tavern and moved his family upstairs. Uh, and Marie's mother was born in Portsmouth Tavern. And this is in the lounge. There's the big double door in the corner. He was said to keep a very tight ship in the bar. No political discussions, no religious discussions whatsoever. He was a great big guy, six foot, six foot four. Um, and uh, kept a very civil bar. Um, and they were not, in Kingston, very civil all the time. Uh, it was quite a raucous place for many years in that day. And we'll talk a bit about Edward's brother, Remigius. And uh, he did apprentice with his brothers in the shipbuilding trade in Portsmouth, um, but he branched out to become a hotel, a hotelier in downtown Kingston and became quite well known. He sat on the council of hotel owners. And um, there's an ad we discovered in the wig, or Marie did, our Beaupre proprietor, number four Market Square. Well, we tried to figure out where that is. And we think that was probably Market Street, which runs right beside City Hall. And on the west, the west side, just above um, Tiernanog, uh, was the Beaupre Hotel, just uh, the next next door to it in one of those stone buildings. And uh, so, you know, it was a great ad. Within a few steps of Wolf Island, Cape Vincent Ferry, good yard stables, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, so a going concern. He also bottled his own wines and groceries, and that was in a building that's still standing at the corner of Brock, and uh, King Street, and you can see punched into that uh, bottle. It said, uh, "It says Bope, our our Beaupre wines and spirits groceries, wines and groceries, um, Anchor Buildings, Kingston, Ontario." So that was the Anchor Buildings is a beautiful big building that's still there with Olivia Restaurant in the bottom of it, on the corner of Market Square. And there's a picture a little bit later, 1885. <laughs> Barnum and Bailey Circus came to town on a boat. And there are the elephants and the horses drawing the circus carriage right in front of Beaupre's Hotel. Everybody out on the balcony to look at the circus going by. And this is a connection to Wolf Island. <laughs> Long time getting to it. Um, Remy first, Remy just first married Catherine Dundon from Gananoque, and her family, we found her family scattered around just a mill, uh, Brewer's Mills, north of Kingston as well. 
and he had a daughter named Agatha Kate Beaupre. And Kate Beaupre, uh, his daughter, married the brother of Remigius' second wife. So Remigius married Harriet Spoor from Wolf Island, apparently a well-known family at the time, farming family. Um, and uh, Harriet had a brother named Richard, and Remigius' daughter married Richard. So an interesting, you know, interesting little connection. Um, and they had ten children, and I think a lot of them lived on the island for a long time, uh, for sure. Uh, Remy died in a tragic accident in 1897, but Harriet lived on on the island until 1943, and she's buried here somewhere. Uh, I'm not sure where. Harriet Boatbray it would have been. Um, so that's just the extra note. His first daughter married his wife's brother. <laughs> Interesting connections. And they had five children, and a lot of them um, remained on the island for a while, and Kate herself died here in 1942. So, grandmother of Marie Peter Moffat um, lived in Portsmouth Village. His first wife, Annie Leahy, uh, they had two... two Annie Mackey. Annie, oh, I still haven't corrected that. Sorry, Annie Mackey. It's better. It's correct in the book. Uh, Annie Mackey um, uh, married Annie Mackey, and when she was a widow, he remarried. Uh, PM was a seafarer as well as a shipwright uh, to some extent, and he rose to be a first mate on the lake schooners, but he retired from that after the, his ship was struck by lightning one day on Lake Erie, and he was knocked out along with all the crew, and the minute he got back to land, he quit and became a guard at KP. And that's him in the middle of the last row, Portsmouth Tavern, was very popular with the guards. It was right across the, right across the bay, easy walk. And uh, Bopes was referred to as Tower Six quite a lot because the guards had five towers on KP. And uh, PM, as I mentioned, uh, had, had a very disciplined bar. And he, he catered to a sort of upper class. He would only sell quarts of beer because anybody, I think he said, anybody who doesn't have a quarter doesn't belong in here. <laughs> Uh, yes. So there's his second wife, PM and Henner, who's well, which was her nickname. They contributed to the Church of the Good Thief on the hill in Portsmouth Village. Um, contributed stained glass windows. Um, and uh, Marie's father and mother contributed stained glass windows as well. And the personal connection that I had to this story was that I grew up in Collins Bay and we had neighbors named Beaupre and uh, Andrea Beaupre their daughter single solo daughter became best friends with my sister when we were growing up and uh, his name was Leo and it turns out he was a captain one of the youngest captains ever certified on the Great Lakes and he's the captain of this Pike Salvage tugboat, famous Pike Salvage tugboat named Salvage Prince, hauling a freighter off a rock on the Thousand Islands in 1957. So it was an amazing coincidence that I knew these people uh, when I was growing up as well. So there's the uh, end of an era. That's the Portsmouth Tavern today. Uh, Peter Moffat died 1956. Leo died in 1963. And the tavern was sold off in 1974. And uh, so, Marie I may wish to tell you now about some of the ghosts in the uh, Portsmouth Tavern. Sure. Um, just for fun. Just for fun. Go. Thanks. Go. Because it's such a small select group, I'll, I'll do my bet. So, um, I was born and raised in Kingston, and uh, as most Kingstonians, when you go off, when you're 
time to go to university, you go away. You don't go to Queens. So I went to Toronto, was there for 40 years, then 40 years in Vancouver, and then I convinced my husband at the time that I really needed to get back to Kingston. I don't know why. I guess the limestone was in my blood or something. I don't know. But I just needed to get back. So lock, stock, and barrel, we moved to Kingston and in 2013. Unfortunately, he passed away <laughs> three weeks later. <laughs> I guess he didn't want to stay. But anyway, so I got through that. Uh, but I really felt like I needed to go home and my parents were long dead and I didn't want to go back to Vancouver because yes I had lived there but they were his friends and anyway so I went to the ports because you know what we we actually lived there at one point for a short period of time and I walked in and the then manager Chuck Norris I said Chuck you are there any apartments in the village i just i need to come back and he said well there's one upstairs and i was like okay good <laughs> so doug Barr, the current owner we got together and i rented this apartment in the meantime before i could move in i'm at saint mary's cemetery visiting the folks trying to find some more gravestones and i got talking to the lady who ran the cemetery bernadette and I was telling her who I was and my connection to the ports. And she was like, oh, oh there's a ghost at the ports. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, sure, Bernadette. <laughs> You've been hanging around dead people too long. <laughs> she said, no, really. I'm like, okay. Her son and her son's fiance had lived at the ports. And they saw and heard the ghost a lot. I'm like, okay, good. So I didn't think any more of it. And then I, before I moved in, I was at... Peter's Drugstore in Portsmouth, and I mentioned the connection, and the lady said, oh, there's a ghost there. And I'm like, you guys, okay, fine. So I move in on Halloween night, <laughs> as it turned out, and um, uh, fine, I, I get in and I'm getting settled, and the next day, and my entrance was at the back up an exterior set of stairs. And you have to go by the kitchen of the port to get upstairs. So I'm lugging stuff up, and the cook comes out, and he said, Are you the lady that just moved in? And I'm like, Yeah. You woke the ghost. I said, I'm, I'm sorry, what? And he said, The ghost. She's been quiet for years, and now all of a sudden you're here, and she, you woke her up. And I'm like, I didn't do anything. I said, well, why? What happened? And he said, well, all the knives in the kitchen were moved around, and there was uh, the rubber gloves, the latex gloves that they used, the box was in the middle of the floor. And I was like, okay, good. I, I didn't do it. So anyway, so I get in, I get settled, and I'm sitting in the living room upstairs at the ports, and I'm telling one of my girlfriends about this story. And I'm like, can you imagine? I said, I bet it's great-grandmother Ann Esther, because she was crazy. <laughs> and uh, the next thing I know, <laughs> I'm uh, walking up the stairs with groceries, and I open the door, and the bags split, and the keys go flying, and the food's everywhere. So I just grabbed up the keys and put it on the shelf and thought, I'll get you later. Put the groceries away. We're all good. The next day, I'm to meet a girlfriend for lunch. My car key is nowhere to be found. All the other keys are there. It wasn't a big space. There was nothing it could like go underneath. I looked everywhere. No car key. And I was like, great grandma Bopri, did you take my key? Nothing. Four days later, I found my key on my desk in my study. <laughs> right in the center of the blotter. So I made the mistake, because I'm a slow learner, of telling another friend about what she'd done. <laughs> Two days later, I wake up, I wear hearing aids. I wake up, I go to put my hearing aids on, they're not there. <laughs> oh, come on. So we had a little chat. I apologized again for calling her names. I said, you know, 
Calling somebody a firecracker is a compliment. It's a good thing. <laughs> Two days later, I find the first hearing aid way up high on the top of a shelf. And I was like, thank you. Could I, could I have the other one, please? Took her a couple of days, but yes, the, um, the um, cupboard in the bedroom, the closet, was louvered doors. And up on a shelf behind the louvered doors was the other <laughs> hearing aid. So we called a truce and I begged her forgiveness and I was talking to some of the, um, so I, I personally didn't have any more interaction, but um, I was talking to some of the uh, baristas downstairs and yes, there was, there's like one corner of the old place and they said it gets really chilly just even on a hot day, cold day, just in that one corner, she's like still hanging around. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, can I just say one more thing that you, there's so much to tell. Yeah. The port was built, uh, the foundation was laid like the keel of a ship because that's all Edouard need to, knew to do was to build ships. So he laid it out and um, he put up 36, family lore, 36 inch square oak, oak, BC oak, um, beam, beam. beam. <laughs> and he put it, it on the floor and er, he dug the foundation out a bit and then he laid this beam and then he did the ribs that came along the floor and up the side just like you would in a ship and the top of the ribs were where they built the first floor <laughs> and then he just built on from that and my you can't see it anymore uh, there was a fire and it's changed so much An another whole story was added on to and a big back area was added on to but my brother who worked there before it was sold out of the family remembers going into the basement and seeing the ribs so yeah the ports was a, a ship yeah, and there was even a Queen's architecture professor yeah. who would bring his students out for a beer and show them the boat construction underneath the Port's Tavern Yeah, as well. For sure, it was quite well known. Yeah. Anyway, thank, thank you, Marie. <laughs> and thank you all for your patience. Any, any questions at all? I, wa I want to say that Anne-Marie and I Anne are related, so... <laughs> She's a Bopri ish too. Sideways. <laughs> On the Bopri tree. -ish. <laughs> On the tree. That's great. No questions at all. Well, that's good. I, we've, we've completed the whole thing then. Thank you so much for coming. Appreciate it. For sure. For sure. I wouldn't have done it without anybody here. <laughs> 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 so thank you very much. <laughs>